Okay, it is 1.30, so we're going to get started with the Parks and Natural Areas Roundtable here at HGAC. Before I turn the lectern over to our chair, Glenn Laird, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, this meeting is being recorded, so just so you know. We're also practicing with subtitles today just to see how that looks on the recording and to see how that works. As a reminder, with all online meetings, please keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. Consider turning off your camera when you're not presenting. If you want to know where the mute and unmute buttons are on Zoom, they're in the lower left hand corner on your computer. There's a chat bar in the middle of the toolbar. Looks the same on your iPhone or your device. The mute and unmute and the video are on the lower left. And to access the chat, there's three little dots on the right hand side that will open a menu and let you access the chat. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce Glenn Laird, Chair of the Parks and Natural Areas Roundtable. Glenn? Yes, uh, thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, it's good to see people continuing to come in, uh, join in the meeting. Um, and um, we're going to this this is really the the kickoff of uh, of our new uh, uh, this go round on our annual cycle and so we'll um, we'll talk more about that uh, um, um, right now um, I'm, what we want to do is really uh, we can go to the first uh, slide yeah here we are um, this year we had a very, very good combined awards with, um, uh, with the WISE um, uh, awards, uh, a total of 109 attendees, a whole new record. Um, it, um, it, it went very smoothly. Everyone uh, seemed to enjoy it. Uh, if uh, any of you uh, were participating, um, what uh, I would like to solicit here is if you have any feedback or if you have any suggestions that might uh, add to, improve, or otherwise uh, um, uh, change up things for next year's uh, awards uh, uh, event, uh, if you would, um, instead of us getting into a long conversation, uh, if you could uh, send emails to uh, Andrea uh, so that they can be shared amongst uh, the group as a whole and can be considered and and discussed as as the year goes by. Okay, next slide. This is our uh, annual award cycle, uh, our normal annual award cycle, uh, which um, uh, uh, begins with uh, uh, today. Uh, generally, we uh, focus on this in March and July in actual meetings, um, which will continue to be uh, uh, Zoom meetings until further notice. Uh, we're skipping over, by the way, um, just so you understand, we'll be skipping over our normal May uh, field trip uh, until further notice. Uh, but then what will happen is between now and the July meeting and, and, um, and other email exchanges along the way, we'll get ourselves up to the uh, point of uh, advertising the awards and soliciting the applications in August. Um, we'll be accepting applications through the whole month of September. And uh, then the judges, which will have been selected obviously by then, uh, will do their, their thing in early October, uh, send it uh, back into the round table. Uh, and in late October, uh, we'll all get a chance to uh, look at the scoring that was submitted uh, and the award recommendations and uh, and thumbs up or thumbs down all of that. Hi, sorry, I'm on um, parks and natural areas too. <laughs> uh, multitasking, I see. Uh, and then and then of course once that's done, uh, it's uh, forwarded over to the Natural Resources Advisory Committee uh, for them to uh, accept. 
then beginning uh, mid January, I mean, mid December, early January, the uh, uh, winners will be notified. Then uh, in January, late January, early February, advertisement for the record uh, recognition event will go out uh, to anybody and everybody that's on the list. And then uh, um, on a Friday morning in mid-February, we will be having um, another one of the events. Okay, next slide. Um, we're going to be uh, looking to everyone for, and again, rather than uh, getting in discussions, et cetera, right now, the things that we're going to be looking for along the way, and really the sooner the better, if there's anyone has any suggestions uh, for streamlining the uh, 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 application and judging process, uh, we would very much like to um, uh, to get that. And uh, we uh, also want to get suggestions for increasing interest. Uh, there are some areas out there that just haven't really participated. Um, and um, you can see there that's uh, basically Walker County, Wharton County, Austin County, Colorado County, the ones that are at literally at the periphery of the HGAC area. Um, even though that's grown a little bit, we have elbowed our way out a little further over the last few years. Uh, we still got those and any ideas at all uh, as to um, what we should try to uh, tease them in to the fold as it were. Uh, then we want that uh, we want that kind of feedback. And uh, the whole awards and awards process, um, the whole thing uh, that we just went over, any suggestions about approving, uh, improving that, uh, we certainly want to take in. And again, the same way, if you have them, email them in to Andrea and uh, then uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll stew on it collectively uh, through the year. And if we make any tweaks, we'll make them at the appropriate moment. And uh, I really do uh, want to get all the feedback and suggestions that we possibly can. So that's kind of where we stand. We we're just kicking it off and we've got um, uh, work ahead of us, but um, the more participation, the better. And uh, that's about all I've got at this moment. Thank you. Next up, we have some great speakers who are gonna tell us about a couple of projects we have going on here at HJAC and across the region. Um, Glenn, would you like me to just introduce our first one? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. That's going to be Kathy Jansen. She is a principal program coordinator here at HGAC, and she's going to tell us more today about Trash Free Texas. And Kathy, if I said your title wrong, please go ahead and correct me. Thank you. No correction needed. I'm really pleased to be here with you guys today. And for those of you who have attended other presentations on the Trash Free Texas project, hopefully you'll learn something new about this endeavor as we move forward. So, oops, beg your pardon, <laughs> click happy finger there. First, an introduction, as Andrea said, my name is Kathy Jansen and I am the Principal Program Coordinator, so you did a great job on that, although I'd answer to just about anything at this point. I am <laughs> a recently returned disciple to any kind of trash collection or mitigation efforts. I'd been the Trash Bash coordinator, and you're going to hear a whole bunch about Trash Bash here in a little bit from the next speaker. Been the Trash Bash coordinator in previous years, hadn't really been involved on this side of the fence in uh, HJC's work. 
but have re-returned and am helping manage this project, which is the Trash Free Texas uh, Litter Mitigation Project. I won't give you the full title because it's so dadgum long. And what's really cool about this project is it's something that's really collaborative. So many of you are familiar, I think, with the Houston Galveston Area Council. You're here at the round table. So you at least know the agency uh, through the lens of parks. And we do a lot of other things. But typically, we only do them within our 13 county region, our 120 plus cities. What makes this project really unique, and I'll get to all of it in just a moment, is that we're doing this in conjunction with a sister Council of Governments. That is the North Central Texas Council of Governments. You see their logo there on the screen, as well as the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment based out of Texas State University. So instead of just looking at the litter issue in our 13 county region or those folks in the Dallas Fort Worth area looking in theirs or you know near Texas State, we're really trying to create something comprehensive and unifying. So really excited about that. Today's agenda, it shouldn't be a super long presentation and I'm hoping if you have any questions, we'll have time at the end to kind of dig in on this and see if there's some opportunities for us to collaborate or to further one another's work. I think, I think there should be. First, I do wanna define the issue. We'll go over why litter is a problem. It, it's pretty basic. Nobody likes litter. Nobody wants to live in a garbage dump, but some of these numbers are rather shocking. Next, I'll dig in a little bit more on the project itself, what it is we're trying to do, what the major goals of the project are, timeline, all of that good stuff, in case you're interested. And we'll end talking about the pathway forward. That is where we plan to go with this project and how there might be some opportunities, again, for collaboration or coordination between your organizations and the Trash Free Texas team. Mm -hmm. So let's jump right in, in defining the issue. As I said, we all know litter is a significant issue for the state of Texas. In fact, over 435 million pieces of visible litter accumulate on roadways each year. And I do wanna make the point visible litter. There's so much that we don't see, microplastics. There's so much out there that in the environment uh, that it's hard to avoid, but just the idea that there's that amount of eyesore and litter uh, along roadways is pretty shocking. It's in our communities, so it's on the side of the roads, as I said, and it flows into rivers, or it blows, rather, into rivers on our beaches. And ultimately, litter collection efforts cost American taxpayers around $11 billion each year. And you think about that, the mitigation costs. When the upfront cost, having more trash cans or a better understanding of people's behaviors and why they litter and things of that nature, certainly we don't spend $11 billion <laughs> in taxpayer money on that. And approximately 80% of that trash that ends up in waterways, because this is ultimately a waterway project, that's coming from a land-based source, again, such as roadways. People throw things out of their car window and it rains and it washes into a local bayou or blows in or what have you. But ultimately, as I said, this project aims to start addressing that issue in a more sort of holistic or unified way. As I said, this is a collaborative effort between the North Central Texas Council of Governments, that's that Dallas-Fort Worth area you see there on your map, the 13-county Houston-Galveston Area Council region, which is a pretty big geography, as you can imagine, and again, the Meadows Center from Texas State University. And now, as I said, typically HJC focuses on its region, NCT COG focuses on theirs, and it's a really unique opportunity for us to look at the six river basins, and you'll see that sort of highlighted on the map on your screen, to see how we can really coordinate on our efforts to try to really move the needle in a positive way. So often it feels like you know, you do one thing in one spot and it's a drop in the bucket and how you really see that change happen in an impactful and meaningful way. Well, we think starting with this really broad region and then expanding to something statewide is really the way for us to get that going. Mm -hmm. So because this is, uh, oh, oh, one more note, apologies. Uh, why Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston, Galveston region will ultimately more than 50% of the state's total population 
resides in our two service areas. Think about that 50% of the state of Texas's population is huge. Uh, it's all flowing together, flowing into the Gulf of Mexico or Galveston Bay first and then the Gulf of Mexico. So we thought this was a really great place for us to, again, have that coordinated effort to see that needle move. So trash removal efforts from these watersheds, as you can imagine, it requires ongoing significant engagement. And typically these kind of projects, there's a lot of expense that is felt by the local governments and a lot of the nonprofit partners, and it can be really burdensome. So that's one of the things this project is looking to address. So we have four primary goals and you'll see those listed on the screen and I'm going to talk through these in a general sense and then I'll dig in on some of the more actionable stuff we have moving forward on the next slide. So what do we want to do over the next three years? Well, this is a project funded by the US EPA's trash free or excuse me, trash free waters program. So something that we've not tapped into as a funding source in the past, although HJC has had EPA grants in the past, we've not had a trash free waters grant. And three years, as I said, we're really looking to target a few core things. So the first goal, we really wanna see an increase in the number of adopt a spot locations in the entire six uh, river basin area, but specifically for my purposes here in the Houston Galveston region. So what is adopt a spot? Well, probably most of you have heard of adopt a highway through TxDOT. You've likely heard of adopt a storm drain, adopt, there's, there's adopt a street. There's a number of adopt a programs out there. Adopt a spot is typically focused on waterway or waterway adjacent cleanups and it's all tracked through the Trash Free Texas website. Trying to better understand where there are cleanups taking place so that when we look regionally and we see, oh yeah, the Keep, I'll say Dickinson because they're such a great organization. Keep Dickinson Beautiful is really active in having these quarterly cleanups. Okay, we know that's happening here, but look at this community adjacent to them. They don't have any cleanups. There's an opportunity for us to either organize a cleanup or get them on board as a coordinator and really try to build that program. So again, we have a better picture for where cleanups are taking place and where there are some holes where people can adopt and really start supporting their community. The second piece to goal one is to promote a statewide trash collection database. Now, any of you that have been involved in any type of cleanup event know that is one of the harder things to quantify when you have a cleanup event. How are you measuring the volume of trash or the weight, excuse me, of the trash you're collecting? It can be really tricky. There are a lot of different units of measure. I know there are specific apps that point you in one direction or the other as far as how you measure, oh, the average bag weighs 30 pounds. Well, that might be the average, but when you have a bag full of plastic empty water bottles, you're not going to get that kind of weight with that type of volume. The type of trash can be indicative of overall amount collected. And so what is being done with this trash collection database, the statewide one, is the uh, Trash Free Texas team has partnered up with the Houston Advanced Research Center and Keep Texas Beautiful to establish this database. And we're so excited to be working with them because HARC, that's the Houston Advanced Research Center, is really active in another local effort called the Trash Action Plan. Those are the partners in litter prevention. I know it's a lot of different names, but just know this, there are a lot of ongoing efforts and we're all trying to sing from the same sheet of music. One of their big goals was to have some unification in how we quantify and qualify the data we have from collection events. The goal is that this statewide trash collection database will have a soft launch this month with a couple of like power users uploading data to see its functionality, test some aspects of it with a full and firm launch in June. Now this is really big because there's gonna be multiple ways for users to upload the data to the statewide litter collection database. But even if you're using different parameters, there's calculation on the back end that helps us compare apples to apples. 
So how might you use this data? Well, if you are submitting information on a cleanup, you're submitting information on what was collected, you can look at what that impact is as a part of a larger whole. It might be something you can use for future funding applications or just data in reporting. And I don't pretend to know all the ways that this might be applicable, but the idea that we have a single repository that we can utilize in the state to capture this data is really, really exciting. So you'll likely be hearing more about both aspects of goal one in the coming days. With regard to goal two, support regional cleanup events through partnerships with local recreational clubs, local governments, and Keep Texas Beautiful affiliates. This is closely tied to goal one because ultimately we don't just want to know that these adoptive spots are happening, but we want to help those individuals who are out there trying to organize cleanups or put something together to alleviate some of the planning burden. Now, we're not in the business of handing out trash bags or gloves or any of those materials. That's not something that we can do at a regional scale with a project like this. But what we can do is share best practices. We can start connecting the volunteers who want to clean up or the organizations who don't know where to start with opportunities in locations some of the things we identified in goal one through the increased adopt a spot locations we can start putting people together helping them plan their events and really giving them the sort of best practices tools and resources to hit the ground running and be successful as they explore additional cleanup opportunities I do want to make a quick note about recreational clubs. This is a really broad category, and this is actually an area where you guys, you parks, people, and enthusiasts are probably best positioned to provide feedback. We will be working with local kayak and canoe clubs, we'll likely be working with running clubs. There's a principle called plogging where people jog and pick up litter as they jog, cycling clubs, other folks who are out there in the mix in nature, partaking in all of the beauty and splendor that really define the character of our region and also trying to offset that uh, potential impact. So we're really hoping to get connected with some of those groups. And if you have some recreational groups that are frequent power users of your facilities or that you think we should be talking to, please don't hesitate to let me know. My contact information will be at the end of the PowerPoint, but I'll also post it in the chat. And I know we have a couple of questions in there and we'll, we'll circle back to those in just a minute. Goal number three, this is in my opinion, the single loftiest goal that we have that is to partner with texas based restaurants to reduce the use of single use plastics really just better business practices it sounds really straightforward but we all know in the post covid world that single use plastic usage is way up and there's any number of reasons for this one folks aren't going to restaurants understandably so uh, like they were in the pre covid times delivery, pickup, third party delivery apps. These are all experiencing a pretty significant spike. Obviously, you're not going to send a reusable uh, material that needs to be washed to someone's home. So we're seeing a real uptick in clamshells, plastic bags, use of uh, plastic silverware, straws and things of that nature. And again, understandably, this project was scoped out prior to <laughs> the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're trying to relearn what a best practice is in the current environment. One of the things we've done is started meeting with, and we'll talk about this a little bit on the next slide, but we've started meeting with the Texas Restaurant Association to have a better understanding of what the concerns are from these Texas-based restaurants, chains, or franchises, and where we might be able to support them in moving the needle. What best practices are tolerable? What is a non-starter? Because ultimately what we're looking for is a win-win. A organization with a bright orange logo is not going to want to see their bright orange logoed cup in the ditch all the time, that's terrible advertising. And again, none of us want to live in a garbage dump. So how do we help them help their patrons or 
help them with their materials or what have you. So more on that in a moment. Final big goal of this project is to take what we do in the six river basins between the Dallas Fort Worth area and the Houston Galveston region and start sharing those successes and the lessons we learn over the next three years with other councils of government and regions across the state of Texas because again we want this to not be a drop in the bucket but to become a huge movement that we can all engage in and to that end we'll be developing materials that we share with those partners as well as our local partners to make sure that again we're all singing from the same sheet of music and we all have the resources available to do the most we can with what we have i'd like to highlight just a few items before I open it up to questions, which is the path forward. So what are we really doing? Well, as I said, we want to see a significant increase in the number of adopt a spot locations we have specifically here in the Houston Galveston region. We're looking to see 50 new sites because as of now, there are only eight adopt a spot locations in this humongous region. And they're all in the San Jacinto River Basin, which is all here really in Harris County with a little bit and a couple of other spaces. And when you think about that, Harris County is a significant player in the region and certainly uh, has a high population. But at the same time, that's only one piece of the larger sort of regional character, right? So we wanna make sure that we see that growth in some of the outlying areas and some of the rural and suburban communities because again, we want to have a full picture of what's happening out there. We had a training on how to become an adopt a spot coordinator on February 25th. We had a little bit over 100 uh, folks register, and I think we had about a 65% uh, attendance rate for those registrants, which any of you who run workshops or events knows that's pretty darn good. Uh, there is a, a lot of attrition that exists with these kind of things. So we were really pleased to see the level of interest and we've already received two additional inquiries for folks wanting to become a coordinator. So we feel like we're on our way to that goal. I am going to share with you guys after my presentation in the chat and then also share with Andrew so she can push it out. Uh, the YouTube link to that training should you yourself think, hey, this park I have in whatever super cool community you represent has a cleanup event, why couldn't we upload our information to adopt a spot and count towards this larger goal? That's a great question. We want to have you. We want you to be our partner. And we can talk through what those benefits are as well. So I'll share that YouTube link for the training here in a minute. As I said, we're also partnering with those recreational clubs. If you have a contact in a recreational club that you think we should be talking to, please don't hesitate to share it. Ultimately, this project only works if we are acting as a conduit for you guys who are the real ambassadors and the people who are plugged into your communities. Next, as I said, the restaurant work. We're working with uh, the Texas Restaurant Association in doing some, I guess, shovel ready work, trying to prepare for what comes next. As I said, COVID-19 really threw this particular goal for a loop, but we're looking at the positive here, which is there's a real opportunity right before businesses uh, resume business as usual, but after the really dire aspects of COVID-19 have been wrapped up and we want to hit that sweet spot we're anticipating starting to convene a work group comprised of those local restaurants, the franchises, or uh, smaller restaurants that are Texas based, the manufacturers of a lot of these materials, some of the city and county folks, because we want to make sure whatever materials we are using, if we're promoting compostable materials, for instance, that there's actually a program in place for us to capture those compostable materials and then process them correctly. So there's a huge solid waste component to this. And also some of the other sort of advocacy groups, right? We're all wanting to come together and talk about what best practices exist, what works well, and, and what people might be willing to do. We're going to be conducting a survey, hopefully, with the Texas Restaurant Association here shortly, just gauging attitudes and understanding where people are coming from. The other piece, which doesn't sound like it's related to a restaurant, but is a really cool opportunity, is we're looking for ways to partner with the Houston Zoo. 
anybody who has picked up the newspaper in the last year or has been to the zoo knows that they no longer offer plastic straws uh, to everyone. Now, that's not to say that there aren't cases where a plastic straw might be needed. Obviously, accommodations for persons with d disabilities and other considerations. Sometimes a straw is just needed for equity purposes. But generally speaking, uh, many of us do not need a plastic straw. We just enjoy the mouthfeel and the ease and comfort. The Houston Zoo has really moved away from that. Not just that, they've tied it to a specific animal and by reducing, say, the usage of single-use plastic like straws, you are saving a sea turtle and they have data on, you know, of the hundred sea turtles they save, they're seeing these many microplastics and particle plastics in uh, the turtle's belly that's leading to a number of issues. So it's really cool what they've been able to capture. Oh, do I hear somebody asking a question? No, okay, Kathy, I think somebody just had a hot mic. Oh, listen, it happens. No worries. <laughs> um, the Houston Zoo also did something really great in that they started partnering with local bars, again, to reduce the use of a specific single-use plastic straws, because that's the hot thing right now. And a lot of marketing and research went into that. A lot of social behavioral change analysis. The great thing about the zoo is they're willing to share all of these analysis analyses with us, all of their resources and materials. So we feel so fortunate to have them as a partner and a great starting base for developing the larger uh, best management practices for reducing single use plastics as we start to work with restaurants at large, hopefully by September of this year. Uh, final thing I wanted to highlight, again, talked about the statewide database a few minutes ago. March, this March, we are doing the soft launch. I say we, it's really Hark and KTB. We're on the Trash Free Texas team. We're just in the background cheering and asking questions with the full launch anticipated in July, 2021. And we will be certain to share that information with you guys in case you are interested or wanna start uploading data to the database. Some other general things that are happening. We've done a couple of surveys. Over the past, I don't know, six months, we did a statewide litter database, uh, oh, excuse me, we did a statewide litter survey where we surveyed not just other councils of government, but cities, counties, many of you in parks may have received it, solid waste contacts, recreational clubs, a lot of folks to understand people's relationship to litter, litter cleanup events, and what their interest or tolerance might be in terms of certain recommendations or behaviors. I should note that anything that comes out of this project is voluntary recommendations only. There's no sort of governing body that's going to hold anyone's feet to the fire. You can't use XYZ. You can't participate in this, that, or the other. It's all voluntary best practices. How can we work together on win-win solutions? So it's cost effective for say a city to conduct a cleanup event, or it's cost effective for a restaurant to switch to a different material while still maintaining sort of the integrity, the temperature, the liquid, and all that in their takeout containers. So that was a really cool thing. I mentioned the restaurant survey coming soon. We also did a survey of other councils of government trying to, again, assess what it is they're doing out there because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If there are already practices in place, resources and materials, we want to gather those up. We've synthesized quite a bit of that data. And while I'm not going to spend time on it today, sharing it with y'all, I do want to tell you that we're going to be launching a newsletter later this month, I think in a week or two. It's going to contain links to those surveys, links to the data that we think are relevant to you guys, updates on adopt a spot cleanups and other partnership opportunities. If you are interested in receiving that newsletter, let Andrea know or let myself know, and we'll be sure to add you to it. Uh, don't plan on spamming you with multiple emails a month, just one larger one with lots of links and hopefully good meaty data that you can climb into and waller around in and really enjoy if that's your thing, which <laughs> judging by the fact that you're here today, I assume it is. We all want to know what's happening so that we can take the next step and make a positive change with regard to litter mitigation in the region.
And with that, uh, again, my name is Kathy Jansen. I am for HJC, the point of contact for the Trash Free Texas program. But I went ahead and included the information for our partners in North Central Texas COG, as well as the Meadow Center, in case you were interested in diving in with them or talking with them about what they're doing. We're all sort of coordinating. And uh, here's our website. That is the Trash Free Texas website through HJC's main website. We're really excited about this. A little bit of a slow start because of COVID, but we're trying to make lemonade out of lemons and find something meaningful that we can do, especially while we have a captive audience. People have never been more connected to the outdoors using neighborhood walking trails and all that uh, like they are now because there are limited options. So we want to exploit that in the most positive way we can while we can. All right, I'm going to pause now for questions. I see some things in the chat. Do you want me to just jump in on these, Andrea? Sure, we were trying to answer them a little bit, but you, you might want to speak to that question. Let me see which one. The Maybe the first one. All right. Is it possible to conduct a study survey of publicly owned property that have fallen off maintenance inventories or otherwise used as illegal dump sites? Are public entities immune from nuisance violation fees and liens? Oh, man, the first question is a really good one that I don't feel that I can technically answer. They shouldn't be, but it's possible that they are. I know we have a couple of our solid waste people on the phone. Do any of you know whether or not public entities can be cited for nuisance or violation for not keeping a facility clean. All right, hearing none. So, oh, sorry. Cheryl Margo is on the phone and um, I texted her offline and she said that typically, oh, here she comes, okay. I'm sorry, I thought somebody else was going to. No, um, so there, um, local governments aren't immune from the, state laws, but typically the illegal dumping that's on their property, they did not illegally dump it. And they would normally work to find who did the illegal dumping and try to get them cleaned up and assess the fines on the people who actually did the dumping. But the TCQ, which is Texas Commission on Environmental Quality or somebody else could file suit against a local government. But again, typically they are not the source of the, the dumping. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. And I see that Edward had several follow-ons as y'all had this conversation. Apologies for not following as I was going. I do know that there are some ways to report things like that outside of the typical channels. There's sort of a unified, the Galveston Bay Action Network, GBAN, is a way to report any number of uh, pollution or litter issues that you see. And then the right organizations or governing legislative body, I say legislative, the, the correct organization can be contacted and then the issue can be mitigated. So GBAN might be worth checking out since it seems like you have a specific pocket park in third ward that you are concerned about, which I would be too. Other questions or about the project or just general information? If anybody has a question, you can go ahead and unmute. I mean, you could type, but you could probably unmute and ask your question quicker than you could type. So go ahead. Okay. Well, hearing none, no worries. I will hang out a few minutes. If you are interested, again, in being a part of Trash Free Texas, being a coordinator or a partner in the Adopt-a-Spot program, any number of aspects of this project, we would absolutely welcome you into the fold. As I said, it only works when we are playing ball with you guys, the ambassadors, the people on the ground. If you think of anything, contact me. I'll put all the information I ref uh, referenced in the chat. And I was so pleased to be here with you guys today. I wish it was in person. I can't wait till we can round table for real. Hey, thank you, Kathy. Glenn, ready for the next speaker? Uh, yes, let's go ahead. Okay. Our next speaker is here to talk to us about Trash Bash, which I hope that everybody's heard of. We've had it for about 2,600 years. No, just kidding. About 26 years. Um, this is our Trash Bash coordinator, also a planner at HDC. Please help me welcome Kendall Gidros. 
All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Kendall Gidros. Like Andrea said, um, Trash Bash has been around for, uh, we've completed 26 annual uh, cleanups. And we were hoping to continue that trend. COVID's slowed us down a little bit. But today, just in case you haven't heard about Trash Bash, I'm going to go ahead and you know, talk a little bit first briefly about what the event normally is and then go into how we have adapted for this strange time we still find ourselves living in. Uh, so as Kathy said, um, Trash Bash is another project we have that works to kind of remove litter from our waterways. Specifically, um, we help to coordinate the annual event, which brings thousands of volunteers each year to clean up our waterways. Um, we encourage them to clean it like they mean it, and we've been doing so for 27 years now. Um, so Trash Bash, however, is more than a litter cleanup. Uh, it strives to work with local partners to create a community experience and also to engage volunteers with education on how they can keep their communities and local waterways clean all throughout the year instead of just at one cleanup event. Each site does so by including interactive games or exhibits um, that the volunteers can participate with at the cleanup site after they've you know, spent the morning picking up trash and when that message might be most receptive uh, in their brains and in their minds. Uh, trash Bash was founded in 1994 by HGAC and the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. And today it is managed by the Texas Conservation Fund with coordination still by HGAC and the Gulf Coast Authority. The real backbone of the event, however, comes from the steering committee, which is made up of the local site coordination teams who do all of the engagement with their communities. They run the sites. And this group is made up of representatives from nonprofits, private citizens, industries, businesses, schools, and civic groups. And like our steering committee, a lot of our funding sources also comes from generous sponsors from these same types of groups. So just to give you an idea um, of our annual platinum sponsors, those who provide about $5,000 or more in cash or in-kind services, um, specifically things like letting us use waste receptacles or helping to pick up the trash after the event um, are shown here from our 2020 event or what would have been our 2020 event. So Trash Bash began with seven sites back in 1994. Um, it's reached at its peak 17 uh, and we had 16 still in 2019. Several sites have actually been closed due to a lack of trash, which is actually exactly what we want to see. What we want to see. We'd love to put ourselves out of business with having no more trash on the land. Um, and the expansion of the Bayou Trail system has also helped us have an impact on several of our locations by allowing us to have what we call satellite locations to reach a little bit more area with each of our sites. Um, so each site is also an evaluated annually to determine if it's still safe, if there is enough trash to warrant all of the volunteers coming, um, and to decide if we need to find new locations. So as I said, we average about 4,000 volunteers at our cleanup events each year, and a large portion of those volunteers are actually youth and specifically scouting groups. Um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, and they come and they're actually a perfect audience for our educational exhibits. They really enjoy interacting with it after the event. Um, so it's exciting to have them come out year after year. And then as an idea of the impact Trash Bash volunteers and cleanups actually have, the results on the screen right now are just from the 2019 cleanup. That's the last full cleanup we were able to have. Uh, and you can see that cleaning up just for four hours uh, on one morning in March each year can have quite a big impact on the amount of trash removed from our watershed. Especially when you look at it across the years, 
Um, when you add up the impact over the 26 Trash Bash events we've been able to hold, the numbers are pretty impressive. What's interesting is that the tons of trash collected has actually steadily decreased over the years. So about a third of the tonnage we were seeing around the beginning of the year uh, of the events, uh, and that's despite doubling the cleanup locations. So that's actually really encouraging. Um, hopefully, that has something to do with the education um, Trash Bash and all of the other wonderful organizations in the area are doing. Um, but it's nice to see a reduction in trash, not because of effort, but because of less trash being at our locations. And then overall, Trash Bash has become known as a fun community-based educational cleanup event. Volunteers love coming back to. They bring their families, the scouting groups return each year, and it's just something a lot of people look forward to. Unfortunately, with the current pandemic situation, um, Trash Bash 2020 was canceled completely. It was set to take place two weeks after um, everything started getting canceled in our region once the, the virus really kind of hit our region. So in order to avoid having to cancel completely again this year, uh, we have decided to reimagine Trash Bash as a virtual event to help protect our volunteers and their families. Uh, and what, we, what we've done is try to call it a backyard to bay cleanup um, with a focus really on that education factor. So instead of spanning an, the four hours that are normally uh, on a Saturday for the event, we've extended the event to four days. And that'll give participants the opportunity to not only view educational videos that are related to watersheds, non-point source pollution and litter, but it'll also allow um, participants to choose the day um, that they'd like to have a personal cleanup in their neighborhood to help remove litter from the watershed with a focus on the fact that, as Kathy said earlier, 80% of the trash in our waterways is land-based. Um, so reminding them that even though they're not coming to a specific site, they are still having an impact on keeping our waterways clean. So we've put together an informational packet and social media tools that'll help um, people learn how to participate, all of which can be downloaded from our website. Uh, which is www.trashbash.org. Um, those include things like a social media graphic, uh, QR codes for the website and for the data reporting form they'll use, and more. Also included on the website and in the packet is the schedule of events. So what we've done is for the first of the four days, we will have educational videos posted on that Thursday morning, starting at 9 a.m. As I said, they'll go over topics of watersheds, point source pollution, litter, and more. Um, those will also all include related activities that students can do if teachers want to include it as part of virtual learning. And then between Friday and Sunday, we're encouraging those personal backyard to bay cleanups. We'll have social media, um, posts going, Facebook Lives to remind people, and we're requesting that they have their data form submitted by Sunday so that we're able to tally up the total impact of the event. So just to give you an idea of how it all works, uh, I want to run through quickly the process of how to participate in Trash Bash. That way, if you would like to um, host a cleanup in your area with your family or a small group or promote it on social media if you have a place that you know needs to be cleaned, you'll know what to do. So the first thing we're asking people to do is to register. Um, we have a registration form on our website and what that does is it lets us know how many people plan to be joining us this year. It'll also once you register, you'll get an email with that information packet. So you'll have everything delivered to you um, to help you figure out where you'd like to clean. After you register, you'll just have to figure out where you want to hold your backyard to bay cleanup. We're trying to promote the fact that while it'd be great if you pick somewhere that has a lot of litter in a small area like a park or some of the areas like you see in the picture, 
it's also really great if you don't have an area like that, you know, take a walk around your neighborhood. In a lot of cases, if you walk with your trash, with a trash bag, or as Kathy mentioned earlier, you try that plogging activity out, you take a trash bag with you, you'd be surprised in just a short distance how much trash you can actually pick up. Um, and that is just as important because every bit of trash picked up is less that can end up in our waterways. So reminding people that even though their spot may not look like a normal trash bash site, all of the trash picked up is, is worth the effort. After you pick your location, you'll start off Trash Bash on March 25th with our educational videos. Um, those have been submitted by partners um, who some of our site coordinators and other organizations in the area. And I'd like to go ahead and make sure um, that y'all can get a sneak peek with one of our videos related to litter real quick. Hi, I'm Celeste with Splash, or Stopping Plastic and Litter Along Shorelines. We're a new program in the Houston-Galveston area focused on reducing trash in the waterways for people, birds, and other wildlife. Debris poses a huge threat to our native wildlife both on the shores and in the water. Trash in the environment can hurt wildlife in two ways, entanglement and ingestion. Let's take a look at these two hazards. Entanglement occurs when an animal is wrapped up or caught in trash. We see this most often with fishing nets or fishing line that fishermen have left behind. For example, shorebirds frequently get entangled with plastic monofilament fishing line. It's easy for them to get caught in and almost impossible for them to get out of. Once caught, the line gets more and more tangled and tightens around the body or legs of the bird. It can cut into the bird's flesh and cause infection and death. Or it can prevent the bird from walking or flying. Limiting an animal's mobility can keep it from hunting or foraging, eventually leading to starvation. Now let's talk about ingestion. Animals can ingest debris when they mistake it for food, swallow it on accident, or when their prey has trash in its stomach. When an animal consumes trash, it can harm them in several ways. It can damage internal organs as it passes through the animal's digestive system, or it can build up in the stomach and block digestion, causing starvation and death. New research is showing that plastics can also harbor dangerous toxins that may impact the health of the animal. As a result, anyone who eats that animal, including humans, will be eating those toxins too. We at Splash are trying to combat these hazards by encouraging proper disposal of trash, especially fishing lines and nets. We are also urging people to curb their consumption of single-use materials. Reusable alternatives like grocery bags and bottles can help limit the amount of trash entering our environment. Another way you can help is by picking up trash on our shores. You can do this on your own anytime while you're walking along the coast, park, or bayou, or you can join one of the many organizations, including Splash, that hosts beach cleanups all over the Houston-Galveston area. If you're interested in helping us with our mission to create a cleaner environment for people, birds, and other wildlife in the Houston-Galveston region, why not consider joining us for a coastal cleanup or bringing Splash into the classroom? You can visit us at www.splashtx.org or follow us on social media. So that's kind of the idea. We'll have short videos like that related to the different topics and then related activities for students to complete to learn a little bit more. Um, and not only does this help encourage better stewardship throughout the year, it introduces organizations they can get involved with um, besides the Trash Bash annual cleanup. Um, so after they watch the videos between Friday and Sunday, March 26th through the 28th, we're going to encourage those backyard to bay cleanups. Um, and we, as usual, have put out, put together a safety video this year. Our, one of our sponsors, Lion Del Bissell, actually helped put together a safety video since it's a little different than our normal um, 16 site cleanups. Uh, and just in case, if you're interested in maybe promoting this event or hosting your own cleanup. Um, as a little sneak peek, you can see uh, the safety video and help you start thinking about what you'll have to consider 
for your own personal cleanups. Thank you for your interest in participating in the River, Lakes, Bays, and Bayous Trash Bash. Cleaning up our waterways can be a fun, rewarding, and educational activity. We want everyone to have a great time, but more importantly, we want everyone to be safe. Register online at trashbash.org. Personal safety is our number one priority. Please follow a few simple guidelines to make sure you and those around you are safe. Please follow all CDC guidelines for COVID-19. Maintain social distance and wear a face mask when in close proximity to others. Wear sturdy, closed-toed shoes to protect your feet and wear gloves to protect your hands. Wear bright colored clothing for visibility, especially if working near any roads. Stay hydrated. Rest if you begin to feel tired or overheated. Take steps to prevent sunburn, use sunscreen and wear protective hats or clothing, and use insect repellent. Be cautious of wildlife. Keep an eye out for snakes, alligators, or harmful insects, and alert those in your party if you see any of these creatures. Watch out for harmful plants such as poison ivy, poison oak, thorns, or vines. Refrain from any contact with wildlife or feral domestic animals. Do not work alone. Use the buddy system of two or more people. Do not put yourself or others in danger. Use a tool to collect trash when necessary and always use your best judgment when picking up items. When in doubt, do not touch it. Only collect trash where you can maintain good footing and do not disturb bare soil or contribute to erosion areas. Do not reach into brush or crawl into crevices, under rocks or structures to get trash. Do not enter, wade or swim in any body of water to retrieve trash. Do not climb up or down trees, rocks or steep banks. Collecting trash along sloping waterway banks should only be done when deemed safe by a supervising adult. Life jackets should be worn on any boat, canoe, kayak, or raft. Do not touch or attempt to pick up hazardous items such as heavy or partially buried items, broken glass, medical waste such as biohazard bags or needles, dead or injured animals, closed or sealed buckets or drums, batteries or ammunition. Please take note of the location of these hazardous items and report it to your local authorities. Uh, so that's uh, our safety video for 2021. That will be posted to Facebook as well. And we're going to ask that everyone who participates watch it, but it's also to kind of help give an idea of what they need to consider when they're picking their location. And then finally, thank you for your interest in participating in the we ask that they share their impact. Um, we have a digital reporting form, and I think that this can be one of the most impactful elements of this virtual trash rash. Um, sometimes it's easy to see when you come to the 16 sites just how much of an impact you have when you have the giant dumpster or the giant piles of trash, um, but I think it'll be really illustrative of the watershed concept and how a lot of our trash comes from land when we're able to show how all of these small personal neighborhood cleanups add up to a large amount of trash as well. So that is how we've decided to reimagine Trash Bash 2021. Of course, we hope in 2022 to get back to our normal event, um, but we'd love to have you host with your family or a small group, a neighborhood cleanup. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to go over anything now. Um, I think that I need to Stop sharing my screen to see the chat though. All right. So far in the chat, we just have a bunch of uh, we have not a but we have cheers for for you. It's a great great video and um, great way to to do trash bash this year without being able to actually have this big event. All right. Well, um, I mean, I'll still be here if there are questions at the at the end of the meeting. Um, but at the very least, if you're interested, feel free to email me. I will put that water resources email in the chat if you have any questions about Trash Bash. And feel free to follow Trash Bash on Facebook as well and share the post, get your neighborhood interested in cleanup. And thank you everybody for uh, listening in today. I thank you, Kendall. Hey, Glenn, do you want to, um get started with the round table 
Well, I would say that would be uh, the thing to do right now. I, I just want to follow in on uh, the two uh, uh, great presentations uh, and just sort of reiterate uh, the fact that you can have the best planned, the best executed parks and recreation facilities, but who wants to go there if it's covered up in trash. And that's why this is such a, I, I think a very appropriate uh, topic uh, to go before this group uh, for everybody to sort of stew on and, and see how they can get plugged in if they're not already um, to um, uh, let's, let's make these public spaces uh, uh, as, as good as we can possibly do. So having said all that, let's move on to the round robin. Okay, I think it'll be easy to um, try to replicate what we do in the room when we are able to go. We'll just go around the list and call out names and people can um, unmute and let us know what's going on. Feel free to turn on your camera and, and do any of that. Um, I, I'll go first so that you can be ready. Um, our next meeting for the Parks and Natural Areas Roundtable is going to be July 12th. I don't know where it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be here on Zoom or if it's going to be in person we'll have to wait and see how things are going but I'll be sure to let you know and as Glenn said normally we would have a field trip in May but HJC is still under COVID restrictions so we're not going to be able to schedule one for us in May but feel free to go out to a park and observe your own organization safety protocols and enjoy one of our parks out in our region we have a lot of them so next up, I'm just going to go down the list, and um, it's not alphabetical, it's a special alphabetical, so just uh, listen for your name or phone number. We have one, it's a phone number, the last four digits are 6606. Would you like to let us know a little bit about what's going on with you and your group? That's you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, we've just had a uh we're going to have a grand opening of our uh community center that we uh built back in the back of the subdivision and uh finishing up some trails uh there's i, I went on about half of them last week and uh, very very nice and uh, and the building is being used by mercer robbery uh to do some of their uh bird bird classes that they're having uh, so we're getting a lot of use out of the building already, and it's not really, you know, it's going to be dedicated uh, pretty soon, March 26th. Thank so, you. Um, is, is this Mr. Messer from Timberlane Utility District? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, I just want to make sure I knew who, who you were and so that we all know who you were and kind of where this community center is. So it's up in the spring area, is that correct? Yes, it is. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, next is Adrian Hernandez. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thanks. Um, I uh, was having some back and forth with the phones and the computer, so thanks for that. Um, I uh, wanted to let everybody know uh, this was a great presentation. It speaks to a lot of what we've been trying to get back to doing at Keep Prairie Beautiful. We've had a ton of interest in cleanup events coming back. Matter of fact, we have a waterway cleanup coming up, I believe this weekend, as a matter of fact, we've got 20 something volunteers ready for that. Um, and then, yeah, we do 25 volunteers for this coming Saturday's waterway cleanup here in Pearland. We also have on March 20th, we're really excited about this. We have over 200 volunteers across multiple organizations coming to do a tree planting event at two different sites here in the city of Pearland. We were awarded a grant through Keep America Beautiful from Aramco to plant 1,000 trees here in the city of Pearland at our JHEC and our Pearland Parkway trailhead, the new trailhead that we have to extend our canopy there. So we're really super excited. We know people in our community and communities across our region are excited to get back out there and make our communities all beautiful again. So I really appreciate y'all, you know, putting this together. And I know we're all eager. If there's anything we can do at Keep Pearland Beautiful to support anybody's efforts, please let us know. 
Thank you. Right. Thank you, Adrian. Next is Becky Martinez. Hi, everyone. I'm with uh, Bayou Land Conservancy, and I was just going to mention that um, every spring and fall we do uh, an adult environmental education class or a series of classes, and we're going to be kicking it off uh, this month on March 25th. If you're interested or know folks that might be interested, um, please point them to our website at Bayou Land Conservancy. Um, it's a fun class. We figured out how to do it, um, being COVID safe. And so it's it's a small group of folks kind of spaced out outside, but we're excited to do it again this spring. All right, thank you. I want to let everybody know that if you have an event that you want everybody to know about or everybody to participate in, please feel free to post a link or a little note in the chat, or you can send me an email after. I'm going to send a wrap-up email from this meeting out to everybody who registered so that you can um, know what happened, and we'd be happy to share that information out to everybody. So next on the list is Casey Collins. Hey, Andrea, it's Tim May. Ah. Not Casey Collins, okay. Um, and, and I'll go, uh, Casey and I are working together on many of our projects. So I'll go ahead and give this report for the two of us, if you don't mind. Uh, Tim May, uh, half associates and uh, uh, great presentations. Uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, real, always really informative and how that may impact a lot of the projects we're doing um, around Harris County and uh, the surrounding counties, for that matter. Uh, just kind of an update. Um, in Precinct 1, we're finishing up a soccer field uh, where we did some lid or low impact development type of uh, construction projects. Uh, that, that construction is underway. It's about a month into it. Uh, should be done by July. Uh, that has some uh, detention and some um, pervious pavement and um, some other lid features uh, associated with that. It's right next to the Sims Bayou. A um, couple other projects that you've heard, this group has heard me talk about is our Mercer Botanic Gardens. We got two projects under construction there. Uh, the drainage and uh, grading operation for the Botcher Track. Uh, north of the park itself uh, on the east side of, of, um, of the road is underway. We're moving a lot of dirt there and creating a lot of detention and also some lid features involved in that. And then on the other side of the, on the west side of the road, uh, we're getting ready to start a restroom project. And that restroom has some money associated with it that's related to the Harvey Fund. Uh, GLO uh, is managing that, that money, but um, that uh, composting toilet down there um, in the parking lot as you first enter that, um, the low activity or the, uh, the passive activity part of the park, uh, that parking lot right there in your immediate right, uh, there's that composting toilet that was damaged by the flooding of Harvey, and we're doing a prefabricated um, restroom several feet above that elevation of that existing toilet and um, uh, we're excited about how that's going to happen. That could become an event center um, with a large plaza out in front of it. Um, that restroom will have a concession airs and to it as well. And so there's a lot of options and opportunities there for Mercer on those two projects. Um, as we were awarded last month, um, the honorable mention of Tascacita Park continues to get uh, recognition and, and some accolades. So we're, we're pleased with that. It was published in a national magazine for landscape architecture uh, last month in January. And I have that link available to anyone that um, would be interested in that if they have not already seen it. And then, um, Mostly Casey, but uh, I've been involved in some of this, but uh, Casey's starting work on uh, some streetscapes for some of the tours here in town. And we've got several other projects in the work and we're proposing on uh, that are uh, public sector government related that'll also have some uh, 
natural and open space characteristics to them. So that's an update from half for Casey and I. Hey, thank you. Definitely interested in that link. If you can post it in the chat or send me an email. Um, sounds like you've got a lot of exciting things going on. Hope you keep us posted in the future. Thank you. Next up, we have Cheryl Murgo from HGAC. Cheryl, do you have anything going on that you want to tell us about? Actually, no, not that I can think of. If you don't subscribe to our newsletter, get it because that's where we put a lot of stuff. <laughs> All right, thank you. Next up is Dan Kalinsky. We'll come back to Dan. Next up is Edward Pettit. Uh, sorry, what am I up for? And we're just having our round table. We're talking about what we've got going on in our communities that we might want everybody to know about. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, sorry. I'm a PhD student uh, at Texas Southern in urban planning and environmental policy. So um, I'm always multitasking, especially when it's midterms week. Uh, but I really enjoyed the conversations today. And um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we're working a lot with Jennifer Boley, who's also on the call, uh, and our friends at the Houston Parks Board on the Healthy Outdoor Communities Initiative. And uh, one of our, the projects that was funded in Third Ward recently was our um, Chess Park, which is a vacant lot that's privately owned um, that we uh, received permission to convert into a pocket park specifically for um, the older chess players of the neighborhood. Uh, but also incorporating a tiny free library and um, urban garden plots. And we have an event coming up on March 20th, uh, where we'll be adding some more garden plots and some signage. And if you're interested in joining that or anything else, uh, we have our own Facebook page. Um, I'll put it in the chat, but you can just search for Third Ward Chess Park. Um, and then we're also doing a lot on illegal dumping and getting other vacant lots cleaned up, um, like the article I, I already put out in the chat. And a lot of that I'm also doing through the Third Ward Complete Communities Initiative. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we're up to here in Third Ward. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And I, is that the pocket park you asked about if it would be eligible to apply for a parks award? Yes. So um, that was the first question I had. I would love to nominate the Third Ward Chess Park uh, next year. Um, and then the other article was a, a separate issue about a vacant lot that we don't yet have permission to turn into a pocket park, but we're definitely pushing up public works and the parks department to do the right thing and uh, let us uh, convert this illegal landfill into um, a park for the community. Okay, well, awesome. Um, like Glenn said at the beginning of the meeting, we're gonna be working on getting the awards program ready um, this spring and summer, and then we will open it in September for nominations. So keep an eye out for all of that because it sounds like it'd be a great applicant. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. So next up was Jennifer Boley. I saw that you are driving. Do you want to wait till you're somewhere? You're um, I just pulled into my driveway. So if you let one person go in front of me, I'll be in front of my computer inside my place. <laughs> awesome. Okay. How about Kelly Burnett? Hey, that works. Um, I work with Jennifer quite a bit. So I'll talk about the things that um, we aren't working on together. And one is um, Agents of Discovery. Um, by the way, I work for Houston Parks Board. I should start there. Um, Agents of Discovery is an app that uh, we have an account with. It's free for people to use. It's described as um, Pokemon Go for nature and education. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We have three, three of them live right now, one in the OST South Union neighborhood at the parks project we're working on there um, at River Oaks Park, which we're working on their community center. So we try to tie them with projects we're working on. And then the third is our newest on Sims Bayou Park at Post Oak and Simsbrook, sort of in Southwest Houston, a nice area there on Sims Bayou. So anyways, if you want to check it out, I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, always nice to spread the word about that. And then I also wanted to mention um, the 5050 Park Partners Initiative. Um, that is the mayoral initiative. Houston Parks Board is a part of that. And our current status there is we're going through um, a lot of the community engagement that happens before projects in the first 11 parks. So we, we bit off a small chunk of those 50 in order to, to make some progress. 
um, during COVID and everything like that. So that's been going well. I have some surveys that are open here um, and it's in 11 different neighborhoods. So would love if folks could um, scan their eyes over it. And if you work with people in that area um, to share those surveys and make sure we're getting um, community engagement on those, that would be wonderful. And I can, uh, I guess, pass it to Jennifer for healthy outdoor community stuff. <laughs> Sorry, I literally just uh, just walked into my place. I was driving back from Waco where I just got my first dose of the COVID vaccine. So very exciting. Um, one thing I would like to, to mention is that uh, we have been doing a lot of work with healthy outdoor communities, particularly focused in the third ward and Acres Homes neighborhood. Uh, our, our work that we're doing is promoting park uh, outdoor nature equity in those communities to, um, to fight health disparities. So we have been um, launching some pilot funding opportunities in Acres Homes and Third Ward uh, to, try to try to get a broad sweep of potential projects that those communities might like to pursue in a, in a larger scale going forward with some of the funding that we have available. We're gonna, we're gonna take away lessons that we learn from all of these different projects. They all have something to do with that park and outdoor equity lens, but each project also ties into another community challenge. And those other four kind of priority buckets are um, healthy food access, uh, education, look, feel, and safety in a neighborhood, um, and then uh, arts and cultural expression. So as we take away lessons that we're learning through these pilot projects, I, I hope that we can share those with, uh, with uh, HGAT in a future meeting. Um, and then we move into our kind of larger scale programming phase through this five-year uh, grant and funding opportunity that we have uh, in the summer. So we'll have even bigger things to share out at that point. But that's, that's our big thing right now is these funding opportunities that we're offering to community-based organizations in these neighborhoods. Um, and then uh, there's of course other stuff going on too, but that, that's something in particular that I'm very excited about right now. I think anytime you can say you're offering funding even for a, a small pilot project, I think that's, that's gonna be pretty much exciting for people. I hope you're getting a lot of applicants and get a lot of good work out of that? We are getting applicants. We've already funded 10. We're about to fund an additional four for sure. And then we'll continue doing kind of these, these uh, rollouts of different funding opportunities. But we're always looking for new applicants. And I'll try to actually post the online application. We've tried to make it as easy as possible for anybody that does want to apply. Um, it, Ed did it, it was a pretty simple process and they got funded for their new sign and, and those planter boxes for their chest park in third ward. Um, but I'll put that link in the chat and if you guys can share it out to anybody that you guys know in the Acres Homes or third ward areas, we would love to get in more applications. Absolutely, thank you. All right, next, I'm gonna hear from, I'm gonna give Dan Kalinsky another shot. All right, we'll go on to Kelly Pinwit. Uh, yes, this is Kelly. I'm the Parks and Recreation Supervisor for the City of Bay City in Matagorda County. Uh, we're trying. We're getting new programming going. Stuff uh, doing some cook-offs that and crawfish events, as well as doing other programs with some small concerts, still socially distancing. Uh, one of the biggest things we're doing this summer, is, uh, actually coming up this spring, is installing a splash pad at one of our neighborhood parks in Amistad Park that uh, Half and Associates helped us with our Parks and Recreation Master Plan and that's part of that uh, master plan going in this, this spring. And just working on next year, looking to do a rally on the river and bringing a program back to help clean up the Colorado River in our section of where our Riverside Park is and trying to get that going back again. It used to be a huge event uh, in the early, you know, when I first got here, but because of floods and everything else, it stopped. But it's just something we want to bring back and help clean up the Colorado River. That sounds like that just aligns with everything we've already been talking about today about cleaning up the waterways. And so that sounds yeah. like a really good thing you, 
getting ready to do there. Feel, feel free to drop anything in the chat um, about what you're doing or any websites where anybody could come and visit. I certainly will. I'll put our Facebook page and our city's website on there that has all our information. Awesome. Thank you. So next is Tracy Tipinaro. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, and see you. Woohoo! <laughs> Excellent. Hi, everyone. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for Rick Rice Park in Katy, Texas. We are 8.5 acres and we were built by Interstate Mud. So I spent a large part of the first weekend of Snowvid answering boiling water questions on email. <laughs> so um, I'm sure you can appreciate what that was like. Our water was fine, thank goodness. Um, so we are working on um, signage at the park. We're doing installing new bridge lights and we're installing a whole new security system, cameras, etc. cetera. And um, I learned a very, we're learning a very painful lesson over this weekend on the signage project. So I started the signage project to read update the park's signs last summer. And I thought it would take maybe one or two months. And it's, what is this, March 8th? And literally we just put the last signs in the ground last week. So great learning process for me. But let me tell you, if you are going to have a sign that says you outlaw firearms at your park, you must have some sort of language on there about accept as allowed by law or because we had this um, gun loving advocate threaten us that if we didn't fix the signs in three days, he didn't threaten with legal action, but he was very blustery. So I just wanted to pass along that painful tip that we've learned that we're going to be uh, redoing some of our signage with the correct language. So we are in complete legal compliance. And I think that's it. Anyone can talk to me if you have further questions on that issue. Well, thank you. I, th I think I w one of the best ways we learn how to do something is to do it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> happy to let us know about that. It was, it was I will never forget that again. <laughs> thank you, Tracy. Sure. Next up is uh, Vicki Gist. Okay, we'll come back to Vicki. Um, and finally, we have um, phone number 8243. I think that's um, Jim Robertson. Am I unmuted now? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm not on the video, but I am on the phone. Yeah, uh, two things I want to mention. Um, the Kikarilla Mission Preserve is uh, uh, a fairly large, significant Precinct 4 park uh, along the Cypress Creek Greenway. Uh, I'm in the Cypress Creek watershed. And I just wanted to mention that um, April 12th to 17th, that's Monday through Saturday, they are planning an event there called uh, Nature for Health Week. And uh, actually, uh, that's in the planning stages now, so I haven't seen final information for it but there will be a number of outside events socially distanced small groups uh, to actually get out uh, at the preserve for various activities and uh, presentations and so that is something that that's coming up also relative to the Kikarilla Mission Preserve uh, precinct 4 has been working diligently uh, to put together acreage upstream and downstream for connectivity of the trail that will go further upstream and downstream along Cypress Creek there, the Cypress Creek Greenway Trail. And they have had some significant breakthroughs in the last uh, few weeks with some of the partners on that that give them access to acreage. And so it's going to significantly increase the connectivity into the surrounding community uh, around there as as they move forward with their trail construction over the next several months. So that, that's good news there. Uh, Northwest Harris County Mud 5 is a mud district that is not right on Cypress Creek, but it is um, touches Little Cypress Creek and Falky Gully, which are two tributaries to Cypress Creek. But uh, it's kind of a neat story, but in 2009, uh, they actually passed an $8 million bond issue for parks and trails. However, for a variety of reasons, nothing was ever done to start that process. Uh, they developed a, t a trail master plan along with that. 
and uh, they are currently, as we speak, completing five and a half miles of trails. They have moved forward with phase one of the trail project uh, that were outlined in that master plan. It's taken a while, uh, but persistence and persist perseverance has, has paid off, and uh, that's going to be a significant uh, addition to the connectivity through the various neighborhoods that, that they serve. Uh, I, I did mention Falky Gully. Again, it's a major tributary along Cypress Creek. Um, Harris County Flight Control did a major project along Falky Gully, restoring it to its original shape. They com completed a project where they hauled out a tremendous amount of sediment that has washed into Falky Gully over the decades. And upon completion of that project, they have planted 1,900 trees along the banks of Falky Gully. So not only has the flood mitigation um, benefits of that been been restored uh, it does have a trail along it and so as those trees grow it's going to greatly improve that uh, that area as a, as a amenity um, Tim May spoke earlier about Mercer I, I just want to mention in the community impact paper that I received online today they have a nice graphic showing the uh, Mercer Botanic Gardens core master plans. First time I've seen that, but it's really impressive what they have planned to implement there over the next several years. And so if you're at all interested in that, I imagine if you just Google Community Impact news, Newspaper Mercer Arboretum, the access to that may be available. I would also encourage any groups, uh, if your area is served by the Community Impact Newspaper, it's a great opportunity to contact them and get publicity information into the newspaper about about your projects because they're always looking for things like that for the local areas to to share. Uh, Kendall, are you still on? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah, I just wondered, uh, something I tried to do was connect Precinct 4 Parks Department with you for the Tri-Space event. Have they been in touch with you? They have not yet. I spoke with someone specifically about Jesse Jones, but um, no one from the from the greater precinct department. Okay, I was on the person they had, so I'll need to follow up on that. So just wanted to check with you on that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. That's a lot. Thank you, Jim, for sharing. You always have a lot going on up there in precinct four, and. Has anyone not had a chance to tell us what you've got going on that wants to? Um, one thing that I'll say, if, if Vicki's not actively on the line right now, I know she's involved in Sugarland, and they have a ton of cool stuff going on in their Sugarland Town Square. Um, I'm going to just put a link to that stuff in the chat for y'all. Jennifer. Oh, there she is. Thank you. I'm here. Cool. I've been having trouble with the mouse on my computer, and so I was talking a while ago, but I had not unmuted yet. It was not unmuting. So thank you, though, for speaking up for us. I appreciate it. Um, so I am Vicki. I'm the executive director for Keep Sugarland Beautiful. And Jennifer's correct. We do always have a lot going on in Sugarland. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight was that our Earth Day celebration this year is going to be virtual. And so we're working um, right now, inviting different groups to participate. So if anybody's interested in submitting a short video for us to include, we have decided to do it um, spread over a couple of weeks so people are available to view at their leisure. We thought this would be easier than a live virtual event. Um, so feel free, I will put my email in the chat box. Feel free to contact me. We'd love to have you join us. So if anybody has any questions, you know, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, I think, I think that might be everybody. I want to thank you all for coming today and sticking with us through the whole meeting. Um, if we were in person, we'd have 30 more minutes, but I think we're going to end early. And I don't think anybody minds a meeting that ends early. And 
I have been recording this meeting and we've been doing the live transcript the whole time. So if nothing is glitchy with Zoom after this, the recording will be available online and I can make the transcript available to anyone who asks me for it. You can just, um, I'm going to send out a follow up email so you can just reply to that. And I'm happy to send it to you, but I don't want to spam you with a transcript that you may or may not want. So just let me know and I'm happy to share that. Uh, Glenn had to leave us early. so. If nobody else has anything going on, which you certainly can, we have 30 more minutes for you to have something else going on. But if nobody else has anything going on, I'm happy also to adjourn this meeting. Sounds good, Andrea. All right. <laughs> Hi, Andrea, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Andrea. Oh, sorry, this is Adrian. I just wanted to uh, uh, let the group know uh, I was in uh, National League of Cities meetings uh, yesterday and today, most of the day. And I, as the vice chair of the Energy, Environment, Natural Resources Committee um, for this week, the EPA did announce that they are accepting nominations currently for their local government advisory committee. And so those are appointments that are done. I believe that the deadline is April 6th or 16th, one of those two. But you can just Google EPA local government advisory committee, the LGAC committee, and they are accepting um, nominations for local government leaders to be part of that committee and um, assist them with building out uh, all sorts of environmental policy across the uh, the nation. So if you are interested in that and if you would like information um, and you can't find it, feel free to email me and I'll be happy to give you information on that to help you uh, um, nominate someone or nominate yourself. So I think this is a great group filled with smart people. And I'd love to have you all in that group. Yeah, it sounds like a wonderful opportunity. Adrian, do you mind putting your email in the chat so I can make sure that everybody has that? I am currently driving, <laughs> but um, my email is Adrian, that's A-D-R-I-A-N, at mykpb.org. That's M-Y-K-P-B for mykeepperlandbeautiful.org. Okay, I'll put it in the chat for you. So if anybody else have anything going on or committees that you'd like people to nominate themselves for? <laughs> Or if you want to be a judge for the Parks and Natural Areas Awards coming up, no one can not make eye contact, right? So you can't. <laughs> All right. So with that, I think this meeting is over. So thank you, Kendall, for posting Adrian's email address. Um, again, I want to thank Kendall and Kathy for sharing about Trash Free Texas and Trash Bash. And again, thank you everyone for coming out today and we'll see you on July 12th. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone.